Um, now, there are many examples of how this dynamic works within the Iraqi government, how the Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds, who are controlling the executive branch, have a complete different agenda from the other Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds who are controlling the legislative branch. The oil law is a very good example. The oil law, I'm sure many of you have heard of the oil law in the last couple of years. It was sent by uh, the it was actually, uh, the law was written by a U.S. State Department contractor called Bearing Point, based in uh, northern Virginia, near the Pentagon. And uh, translated and sent to Iraq. Of course, the Bush administration's allies rubber stamped it and sent it to the legislative branch to be ratified. The legislative branch has been resisting that for over a year now. So, it's, it's obviously not a sectarian or religious conflict uh, that's happening there. Uh, it's, it's obviously that the Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds who have on that agenda uh, are, are uh, united against other Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds. The other. Now, the major debate in Iraq uh, that has been happening in the last few years is that there is a majority of Iraqis in the public and in the parliament who want the U.S. to leave completely without um, leaving any permanent bases or troops or uh, private contractors. In fact, like, the debate was even beyond uh, this election. It started once the U.S. came to Iraq. Some people wanted the U.S. to stay, some people wanted the U.S. to leave. And now the... <coughs> Proportion is, is really big. Uh, I mean, there's a big difference between the Iraqis who want the U.S. to leave and the Iraqis who want the U.S. to stay. Uh, according to most of the polls, uh, Iraqis who want the U.S. to leave completely without leaving any permanent bases. It's more than three fourths of the population. Some polls uh, indicate that the number reaches to nine out of ten. Uh, but more or less, it's more than three fourths of the population are for a complete withdrawal. Now, more importantly than just polls. Maybe someone can argue that you don't get uh, accurate polls in a war zone. The Iraqi parliament has been asking for a complete U.S. withdrawal for the last years, and no one has been listening to them. In fact, my organization, the American Friends Service Committee, invited two delegations of parliamentarians, Iraqi parliamentarians, to Washington, D.C., where I live now, uh, this year alone. And we had, in the two delegations, we had... Um, uh, Shiite and the Sunni and the secular uh, parliamentarians. And all parliamentarians who were invited uh, to the Congress said, we want a complete withdrawal that leaves no permanent basis. And this, the timetable for, for this withdrawal might be three months or might be three years. We don't really have that much preferences. It's more about having the complete withdrawal, the idea of complete withdrawal and then discussing the length of the withdrawal. Now, in the U.S., unfortunately, we're not there. I don't feel like, especially in Washington, D.C., I don't feel there is a discussion that, that is between a group of people who are for a complete withdrawal and another group that is for keeping the U.S. there on the long term, because both the parties in D.C. are for keeping permanent basis, the Democrats and Republicans are for keeping permanent bases on the long run. Um, and, and this is very unfortunate. It's very frustrating to realize that the U.S. government is not, it's not like the U.S. government is not choosing the right option. It's more about the U.S. government not discussing the right option. The two presidential candidates so far uh, have had many similar uh, ideas on foreign policy in general. Uh, but uh, on Iraq, it's even more, more identical because both of them, uh, Obama and McCain, are for keeping troops in Iraq uh, on the long run. They call it a residual force. Or whatever. And I think most of my work in DC is to, uh, to say that, that the most important point to talk about it is to talk about a complete withdrawal. And this is the only thing that will change the situation in the ground. I mean, the two presidential candidates' plans are to leave um, 
exceptions for troops to stay in Iraq indefinitely, and these exceptions include training Iraqi forces and protecting the U.S. embassy in Iraq, and some counter-terrorism attacks or whatever. And these three exceptions will leave between 50 and 75,000 troops, and uh, another number of contractors, which is half of what we have now, you know. So I don't think that Iraqis will wake up one morning and say, now that we have half the number of our troops, let's have half violence or half resistance. It doesn't work that way, you know. When people want their country completely, I think it's more about having the last US soldier leave Iraq. Iraq fell under many occupations in the past. Iraq as a nation is really, really old, uh, like as people say. Uh, it goes back to 7,000 years, from the time of Mesopotamia and Babylon and uh, Assyria, or whatever the civilizations were called at that time. But Iraq as a country, as a nation state, is of course younger because the idea is younger, the idea of nation state is younger. Um, since Baghdad became the capital of what we call Iraq today, since Baghdad became the capital, the city was built. This happened 1250 years ago, around 13th 13, 13 century ago. Since Baghdad became the capital of, of Iraq, until today, Baghdad was occupied 20 times. And this is the 21st occupation. So it's not unprecedented. You know, my grandfather was alive when the last occupation took place. In, uh, when the British uh, troops attacked uh, Iraq and occupied in 1917 and continued until the, maybe the 50s of, of the 20th century. That occupation happened. Most of Iraqis uh, who are living now, either them or their parents or their grandparents were alive. So it's a part of the collective memory. And when that occupation happened, most Iraqis remember the Ottoman occupation. And when the Ottoman occupation happened, most Iraqis remember the one before. It's a very important part of the Iraqi collective uh, memory and consciousness. Uh, it's a very highly contested part of the war. And wars happen a lot there. Now, there is no one precedent, no one single precedent, of the former 20 occupations where after the occupation leaves and ends, the sky falls and the Iraqis kill each other and terrorists come take over. It doesn't happen that way, no. It happens the other way. While Iraq is under occupation, exactly how Iraq is under the 23rd occupation now, the sky falls every day. And terrorists interfere in Iraq every day. Regional powers interfere in Iraq every day. The Iraq has no sovereignty and no independence. So I don't think, I mean, to sum up my answer, I don't think there is in Iraq a fear of a lack of an occupation. It's not like people are freaking out, what are we going to do if we stop being occupied? And I think it's the other way around. People are worried about being occupied by a foreign power that has caused the death of one million Iraqis in the last five years alone. In the last five years alone, one million Iraqis were killed and five million Iraqis were displaced, they, they lost their home. So, I mean, imagine this on a U.S. scale. Imagine if some other uh, country in, invades the U.S. to liberate us from the Bush administration and <laughs> set us free. Uh, and then they will say, uh, yeah, we're here to make you, the Americans uh, free people and better people. And then in five years, they kill 12 million Americans and displace 60 million Americans. This is the scale, because Iraq is a small country. It's as big as half of California. You know? So one million Iraqis displaced, uh, one, five million Iraqis displaced, and one million Iraqis killed. is equivalent to 12 million Americans killed, and 60 million losing their homes. So I mean, imagine if this happened to the US. Do you think any Americans would be saying, please stay and liberate us a little bit longer? I don't think so, you know? I mean, it's not about Iraqis or Americans, of course. Uh, humans don't try to be occupied. It's a human nature. And I think the same way that we don't need to go around the world and ask people if they like to be tortured. You know, when the United Nations put its uh, human rights declaration, they didn't ask every nation, like, okay, Iraqis, do you like to be tortured? No, okay. Iranians. You know, it's, it's like too general. And I think the same way that people don't like to be tortured or enslaved, people don't really like to be occupied.